Alrighty. So, a couple things today. We're going to finish talking about functions. We will talk about project one and project two. I'm sure you're all very excited. <laughs> We're getting there though. Um, so this is actually week one, two, three, four, five. This is the end of week six. Um, at the end of week six, we're essentially halfway through, right? Because we have one, two, three, four, five, six more weeks of new stuff. This last week is real short because um, recursion is a big topic. Next semester, we're just going to touch on a couple things um, as we go. So we're about halfway done, believe it or not. And it is only October 4th um, with new stuff, right? New material. So uh, we're just cruising here. Should be a lot of fun. So we pull up PyCharm. We'll start with project one, then we'll finish talking about functions, and then we'll talk about project two. Does that sound good? All right, and now I'm actually gonna solve project one using functions, because I think functions are fun, and it's it's another way to see how you can do something you already know how to do with a function. And again, it's you know coming up with them from scratch is a little tricky sometimes, so that's okay. Uh, so we'll, we'll start and see if we can't use functions to solve this for us. So this is project one, Create that in this window, refine project one, make sure we get the definition right. So the first thing we're doing here is before we write any code, we, we have to take kind of take a step back and think about what we're gonna do. Think about the different steps that are happening here. And we can do that functional decomposition, kind of take a big problem and break it down into smaller and smaller and smaller problems here. And you can always change things as you go, but at least we have a plan. If you just start writing code without a plan, it's not going to go very well for you. You're just going to get really frustrated. So we need to think about all the steps that are involved, what has to happen here with those steps as we go. So all right, our lunar lander, we get some commands. We have a distance from the surface. We have some variables between negative 10 and 10 for tilts. We get different commands. We need to find the valid commands. It's all going to be in a loop. And then distance from surface goes down by one. And then we, we crash or not. And all of that is in a loop that says we want to play again or not. So a lot of different pieces already here. Right? But we can think about um, kind of from the outside in if we want. Right? If all of it is in a loop, figuring out whether or not we're going to play, we can start with that. So we can have a little loop here. Right? We'll say, hey, like play again equals a y. And while play again equals a y. And then probably all of this uh, as lowercase, right? just in case they enter weird things here, we can print or get uh, play again. It's equal to an input of do you want to play again? Do you want to play again? And then again, tell them what you're expecting, like a Y or an N here, right? So now we have that first play again loop done, right? We've got that part. We've broken that down. Now, now we can work on the rest of it, right? And we can even test this, right? It should just keep on asking us to want to play again over and over and over. Yes, 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 yes. Anything other than a Y, then it stops. Right? So I know, okay, this part of the loop is working here, right? Sure, well, what's next? So the next thing looks like, hey, let's start one version of this, right? So let's, how do we start this off? Well, we need distance is 10, and then X and Y tilts are between negative 10 and positive 10. Sure. Now, if we are setting two values to the same random range here. You're, you're probably thinking to yourself, hey, that's the same line of code. I don't want to have the same code twice, so otherwise I'll feel bad about myself. It's true, right? You don't want that. So let's turn this into a function, right? Why not? So we can have a function here. You know, it's not gonna be a very interesting function, but that's okay. We can make a function uh, of get random value negative 10 to 10. Uh, sorry, hold it. Doesn't need any arguments. Right? We don't need any parameters here to get a random number. Now, this is not super interesting, but that's okay. Um, we're just kind of breaking this down step by step by step. So if we import random, right, we can return random.randint, and we want negative 10, positive 10. Not the most interesting function here, but sure, now we're doing it. Now we have a function that does it. We don't have to have the same random randint two times. Sure. I mean, we didn't really gain a whole lot, but that's okay. Um, we, we put a name to what's happening here. So inside of my loop here, I'm going to have my distance from surface starts at 10, and I'll have an x tilt is equal to a get random value, negative 10, and a y tilt is a get random value, 10 to 10. Sure. So I put a name to what's happening. 
even if it's, you know, this one's just a one liner, this is not super hard, um, but that's okay. So we put a name to what's happening, right? Then what's gonna happen? Well, now everything is gonna loop here, right? While my distance is not 10, or maybe we turn that into a function. The next part here is maybe we say, hey, this is get lander to surface. Now, to get the lander to the surface, it probably needs to know what the x tilt is and the y tilt is. Right, this next piece here, or let's put a name here, let's get the lander to the surface. So this will have to get some commands and figure out how we get to the surface. Sure, so if you tell me what the tilts are, we can go ahead and do that. So if that's the part that gets it to the surface, I probably don't need distances 10 here. Inside of that function, I can have get lander to surface, given an x tilt and a y tilt. I can set my distance as 10, and this can loop while my distance to surface is greater than zero. Let's do something, right? You give me the x tilt, you give me the y tilt, we'll keep on going, we'll get to more than zero. Sure, we can do that. Um, so while it's more than zero, we have to get a command, right? We need to go and ask them, hey, do one of these things, and we have to make sure that it's valid or tell them what the valid commands are. So we might say, hey, the command is equal to get valid command. All right, well, to get a valid command, we have to write a function for that. And just kind of breaking this down into step by step by step. So you can get valid command. So we can have a command is equal to something here, nothing to start. And while my command does not equal, uh, uh, not, not equal x plus, and my command does not equal x minus, um, oh goodness and my command does not equal y plus. I, I, I wanna bump these down here so they fit a little better. I'm use those slashes, that's annoying. And my command does not equal a y minus, right? That's a valid command. And my command does not equal thrusters, right? And my command does not equal, uh, was it self-destruct? Destruct. Destruct. And my command does not equal nothing. Right? Nothing was technically valid as well, right? So if it's not any of those, right, we need to command as an input of enter x plus, x minus, y plus, y minus, thrusters, self-destruct, or nothing. And when we're done here, right, we can return that command. We want to give that back. I think it's a little more proper to tab these in one further so it doesn't look like they belong to that code block. Uh, Python's okay with that. So we just get a command. Eventually we'll get something that is, one of these becomes false because it is one of them and the whole loop will stop and I can return that command, right? So we can get a valid command out now, which is nice. So uh, we can say, okay, let's get the command inside of my loop here, get a valid command. And then now we can start comparing. If my command is equal to uh, x plus, and now probably we want that lowercase, right? So maybe this command input here, we can just lower, right? Oops, goodness gracious. Right here, dot lower, right? Take it all to lowercase. That'll make life easier for us, right? So if it's equal to x plus, we'll take our x tilt, plus equals one. Now if my command is equal to, oh, double equals, there we go, double equal sign. X minus, we'll take our X tilt, minus equals one. I'll if my command is equal to a Y plus, we'll take our Y tilt, plus equals one. I'll if my command is equal to Y minus, we'll take our Y tilt, minus equal one. So those are kind of the easy ones here, right? We'll just change our tilts here as we go. Uh, I'll if the command is equal to thrusters. Then we're gonna take our distance from the surface and we're gonna add two. Right, thrusters increases your distance by two. And then I'll if my command is equal to self-destruct. Let's call the self-destruct function. I don't have one yet, but we can go make one, right? Sure, so we can go make a function for self-destruct. Self-destruct. And again, uh, until you have something here, you can use that pass keyword just so the red lines go away, because red lines bother people. 
nothing doesn't matter. It's not going to do anything at all. So I don't have to have an if here for it. Right? I know I'm getting a valid command because this one is looping until we get a valid command. So once all that's done, I can take my distance from the surface, subtract one, right? Because val every valid command decreases my distance by one. Right? Okay, so now I can get some commands, figure out what it is, do the right thing for them. Again, we'll come back to self-destruct, decrease our distance. Now, what we're not doing is telling users, hey, what their tilts are and what their distance is. So maybe we write that as well. So maybe we have a display status. To display the status, you need your distance from the surface, you need your x tilt, and you need your y tilt. Right? So we can write another function, display status, that takes a distance from surface, it takes an x tilt, and it takes a y tilt. Now, again, these names don't need to match. They don't have to be the exact same. You can call it a, b, and c. But please don't, right? A, B, and C are terrible variable names. You, you want to use a nice, meaningful variable name. So they're going to match because that's the nice, meaningful variable name. But, but they don't have to is all. So now we can print, you know, distance from surface is uh, distance from surface, distance from surface. And then maybe we print, um, how do we do a formatted string for this one? So your x tilt, x tilt is the x tilt. And then the y tilt is equal to our y tilt, y tilt. Okay, so you just print those things to display our status, right? And you want to get into the habit, if you're using a variable in your function, you need, you need it as a parameter. Technically, Python lets you do dirty things like come up to the top here and say, hey, I have an x tilt as something, and then you can use that everywhere. That's really bad practice. We're going we're gonna to pretend like you can't do that because that uses some global variables and we'll get into that later, but just pretend like you can't, okay? Um, we're going to, if you need a variable in your function, pass it. That'll make life easier here. Um, okay, so we've got our status, right? We get a command, we do our thing. We'll self well, okay, so we got to figure out self-destruct now, right? So what does the self-destruct do? Uh, how about we say, I don't know, the cancellation, cancellation code is a nothing. And while my cancellation code is not equal to, what, what should the cancellation code be? What will actually cancel this? What should we enter to cancel our self-destruct? 1501, sure. Okay, so as long as it's not 1501, we'll say my cancellation code is an input of self-destruct sequence activated, activated, and there are Cancellation code, right? Eventually, they'll probably give us something that is not 1501, or that is 1501, yeah. Sure, that's fun. Yeah. Well, the captain of the ship usually gets to pick his own password, so that's nice. Uh, and eventually, like, we get out of this, this loop is done, we can say self-destruct uh, aborted. Sure. So we're done with self-destruct. But it, it, the only thing it lets you do is enter the cancellation code, right? Nothing else will work here. And we have it as a separate loop. Okay, so I think that's it. Okay. This is our game now. So with functions, again, just for fun, let's give it a try. All right, so we got nine and seven. Do you want to try and crash the lander or do you want to try and land it? Okay, let's crash it. So we just do nothing, 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 nothing. Nothing, nothing. Uh oh, we, we didn't have a stat. We didn't have a did we win or lose, right? Oh, well, we forgot that. That's okay. So we'll come back here. So after we get the lander to the surface, right, what do we do? Right? Okay, so we know this loop when it's done here. We're done. So let's come down here and how about we say display, uh, or I don't know, did display. Landing status, I don't know, that, that's kind of ugly, but that's fine. And if we have to tell it the x tilt and the y tilt. Sure, we'll write another function, because we love functions. It's not really saving us anything here, but that's okay. Display landing status, give it an x tilt and a y tilt. We're just breaking it up into pieces here, right? Every every small piece could be a function. It's not going to hurt anything here. Um, we can say, hey, if my x tilt... Now, remember, Python is truthy. It's really silly. It's a funny word. So every value is either true or false. So 
with numeric values, if it's zero, it's false. So I can say, if I like shortcuts here, I can say if x tilt and y tilt. And that shortcut for x and y are non-zero values. Right? If they're not zero, this is true. Right? Uh, and really, this should be either of them, right? If either of them are non-zero. Right? If this is anything other than zero, or this is anything other than zero, we must have crashed. And print. You crashed the $3 billion lander. Uh -oh. Otherwise, right, if they are both zero, this whole thing will be false. Print. You landed successfully. Enjoy the moon. Right? Sure. So this is just the shortcut. You don't have to use it, but you'll see this a lot because people like that because Python is truthy, you have to type less. That's all. So it just means they're non-zero. Right? Non-zero is true. So any numeric value, if it's an int or a float, if it's not zero, is true. So we're saying if x tilt or y tilt. So if either of them have a value that's not zero, this is true, we must have crashed because there must be a one or negative one, some value, right? If they're both zero, this will be false because zero is false. So false or false, if won't run, we'll get our else. So this is both x and y must be zero, right? Um, just a shortcut, right? So we would probably write it like if x tilt does not equal zero or y tilt does not equal zero. And that's probably how we would write it, but this is a shortcut for that because all of our variables are truthy. Okay. All right, so let's give that a try. All right, so let's again, let's crash here again. Nothing, nothing, nothing. And if I give it something that's not a valid value, right, it's keeping me in the loop and it doesn't count against my distance, right? Only valid commands count against the distance. Nothing, nothing, nothing. All right, we crashed the lander. Uh oh, let's play again. Let's see if we can land it this time or let's self destruct. Self destruct. Uh oh, enter cancellation code. All right, one by one, it got canceled, but our distance went down by one. Sure, so we want x minus, x minus, x minus, y minus, y minus, y minus, oh, y minus, y minus, uh, nothing, and nothing. All right, we got to zeros for our tilts. We landed successfully, enjoy the move. No, we're tired of our game. Okay. So, how's that feel for the project? Again, I've done this a lot, I know how it works. So, if it took you more than 20 minutes, that's okay. It's really if it took you 20 minutes, awesome. You guys are rocking it. That that's you're a good place. Um, more than 20 minutes, it's okay. If it took you like 10 hours, we probably have a problem, right? But ideally, this was you know maybe one, two, three hours worth of work of, of playing and trying and coming back to it and getting frustrated and putting it down and then coming back to it later. Um, that's okay. Um, no no big deal there. So um, this is probably a good measure for for how it felt, how much effort you had to put into it here. Um, if it took you a lot of time, let's do some more practice, right? Uh, think about, are you putting in the, the amount of time in practice and studying and, and those sorts of things, right? It's a four credit class. So we spend actually more than four hours because we have lab time, which is weird, but they count it differently. I don't, I don't understand how that works in academia. Uh, but four hours in class means you should have eight hours a week of homework or studying or practice or, or doing something here. So it's like 12 hours a week commitment for just this one class, right? If you're putting that in and it's still taking you a really long time, let's chat. If you, it took you a really long time, but you're not putting in that much effort, let's get up to that amount of effort on that sort of thing. Uh, so, all right, so let me commit this here. So this is project one, commit. And I wanna show you one fun thing here. Um, so let me, cause the idea of having screenshots, right? We wanted to show that it runs is really handy here. Uh, I'm not gonna screenshot everything. I'm just gonna grab just a little bit here for fun. Now, when I view this on GitHub, I have the readme file here. I probably don't want to put it in this main readme file because this has a bunch of other stuff here, right? right? Now, you have one repository for project per project, which is nice because it organizes it nicely. This is the class repository. I don't want you to have 15 different links. I want you to have one link to look at all the code. So what we can do is I can go to the project folder and I'm going to kind of cheat here and I'm going to add a file online because I don't want to have to bother doing it on my computer. So I'm going to create a new file. If I call this readme.md here, I can paste in my screenshot and commit it here. Now I've got a readme file, Let me refresh. If there's a readme file, the GitHub website says, hey, you probably want to see what's in it. It's a convention. 
if a folder has a readme file, it displays the readme file. So I can have a readme for each individual folder, which is kind of fun. So uh, a lot of times people like to go and make a portfolio of their work on GitHub to show off the things that they do. So when you apply for jobs, like here's my GitHub profile. You can have, here's your portfolio page. You can have readmes, you can have sub projects, you can have different repositories for projects, however you wanted to organize it here, but you can have multiple readmes if you want. Uh, so people, you can go through and organize and see what's going on there. So like on Microsoft's account for VS Code, I feel like they've got more than one readme, maybe not here. Their readme file has a bunch of cool stuff in it. Right? You can see this is all a bunch of details about it here. Uh, I don't know if they have any sub one. They probably did at one point, maybe not. Yeah, maybe not in here. So. Uh, some other other projects might have readme files inside of other folders as well, uh, which is kind of fun. Okay. You okay so far? That was project one. All right. Uh, we got that committed. Let me go back and open up um, our functions project. So a couple more things about functions that we didn't get to yet. Uh, function stub, branches and loops. Functions are objects. This is kind of crazy and insane. We're not gonna do a lot with it, um, but the, the fun little example here is cool. Sorry, I have to sneeze. Oh, maybe. Does looking at a light make you sneeze? It works for me, but apparently that's a genetic thing. My, it doesn't work for my wife. All right, it went away. I'll come back later. So, because the way Python reads files and interprets them, right? We said you have to define the function first and then you can use it later. It has to go and understand, it has to know what the function is first. So it, it reads it in, it has to put it somewhere. It has to store it somewhere. Python will treat everything as an object. It loads everything as objects in memory, which you know, it has to put it somewhere. So sure, it, it's gonna help put it there. What that means is you can also pass a function as an argument which gets to be real nonsense here. So we'll, we'll, we'll take a look at, uh, we'll say here's a define a print greeting here that takes the, how about a name and a greeting. So if you give it two things, you give it a name and a greeting, it'll do that. So the first thing it's gonna do is it's gonna print, um, uh, I'm sorry, the first thing it's gonna do is call greeting. So greeting, if you pass it as a function here, we don't use parameters, so I'm going to zoom it in. We don't use parentheses. We just say, hey, I want this thing called greeting. If you put parentheses on it, Python says, oh, you want to call that as a function. And then we can print name. Um, so we'll do that. We'll see how well this works. So to print a greeting, you give me your name, and you give me the greeting here. I will call the greeting function, and then I will print your name. So if we have another function, like here's the um, a tired greeting. So a tired greeting might say print, um, hi, I'm tired. And then we have a copy induced hyper greeting. And this one prints, hi there, I'm having a great day. How are you? Did you get any coffee? So, 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 so a bunch of other stuff here, right? Then what I can, yeah. So these ones, I don't need any parameters. I'm just doing something. You don't have to give it a parameter. I'm not going to use any parameters here. I could if I wanted, but in this case, they're just going to do some code and stop. They don't need it. They don't need any parameters. They're not going to do anything different based on what you give it. So they just say, they greeting. Parentheses. Yep, that'll call the tired greeting. Because they, here's my coffee induced hyper greeting. It'll do that. If I want to say print greeting, I can give it my name, and then I can give it the name of a function. So I can give it the tired greeting. Now I don't give it the parentheses. I just give it the name of the function here. So that it passes the function as an argument. And I can print my greeting using my name as Eric and my coffee induced hyper greeting here as a function. This gets to be really silly. It's, um, this is not super common here, but you might see it. So uh, just, uh, just so you know that it's there. Then we're gonna get, all right, so we got the tired greeting, we have the hyper greeting, we got the 
next version of it, when we did our print greeting and then the name, we got the next greeting and the name. This looks like a bunch of nonsense. Actually, let me move this up to the top here and I'll put a breakpoint in. Put this up at the top uh, after our functions here. All right, uh, there's the weather. Okay, up here. So I'm gonna put a breakpoint in right here so we can watch this. So instead of hitting run, I'm gonna hit debug and we can watch it run. Right? We get our call stack. We're in main at line 83. Right? We're ready to run line 83. So I can step into my function if I want, or I can step over if I want to see. I'm sorry? So stepping into will, will go into the function. If I step over, it'll run the function and go to line 84. So if I want to see what's happening, I can step into. Now I'm entire greeting line 77. When this is done, I'll come back to line 83 where I left off. Right? I left that bookmark. It'll come back here. So now I can print hi. Right? And I see it in the console. Print hi, I'm tired. We're back to line 83. The next thing it does, now it's at line 84. We can step into, now we get to line 81, right, of the coffee-induced hyper greeting. Sure, we can print that. We come back to line 84. Now let's go to print greeting. So print greeting gets to line 72. It was given a name and a greeting. If you hover over it, it says, hey, name is Eric, it's a string. And if you hover over greeting, it says, Greeting is a function, tired greeting at, and this is like the memory address. This is where that is stored in memory, right? It has to, when it reads to the file, it has to load everything and store it in memory so you can use it. That's the memory address on my computer. It's in hexadecimal. If you like different interesting number notations, that's the base 16 notation. Someone really smart came up with it years ago. We've been using it ever since. Sure. Uh, so that's the function here. So I can step in again, and now I get hey, I was at line 72 of print greeting, now I'm at line 77 of tired greeting. So we can see it's just adding these function calls to that call stack, and we're leaving those bookmarks. Where do you come back when we're done? Print that, and it prints name. Now we're on this line here. I can step in, and I can step in. Now I've got my coffee-induced hyper greeting, I've got my print greeting, I've got my main here. We can step through and see all these things running. So debug lets you kind of follow along and see what's happening as we go, which is really fun. So you can pass functions to objects, or functions are objects, so you can pass them here. So their print face says, hey, here's the human head, here's the monkey head. So printing a stick figure says, print the face. So you tell me whatever face you want, and then I'll print the body. So you can pass a different function for what, how to print the head. Sure. Um, again, kind of a weird thing, but that's okay. So some common errors when we're getting to functions. When you copy-paste things, we're going to make mistakes. I do it all the time. So I'm, I'm, I'm doing that on purpose to show you that you're going to make mistakes when you copy paste. Clearly, I would never make a mistake on purpose. But I, or I would never make a mistake because I'm perfect. I, I'm doing it on purpose to show you guys that it happened. it'll happen to you, right? Thank you for believing me. It's very kind of you. So there, convert Celsius to Fahrenheit conversion, given a Celsius temperature. Does the 9 fifths times Celsius adds 32 and it returns the Fahrenheit temperature? Sure, we can convert. When they copy pasted, they changed their arithmetic correctly. They take 32 away from Fahrenheit, and then they multiply by 5 ninths. But what's wrong is they forgot to change the return. They're still returning the Fahrenheit temperature. This is perfectly legitimate code. It's working code, but it's wrong. There's a bug in it. Right? We just told it to do the wrong thing. So it's not going to work the way you expect because we screwed it up. So just be careful when you copy paste things. Because it happens to all of us, that's okay. That's why we, we want to run our code and make sure it works and it does what we expect it to do after we're done. Okay. Um, all right, here's the scope piece that I was talking about. This idea of having variables that are accessible different places. So if we have our variables here, we declare them first, you can technically use them inside the function. Again, I'm going to argue this is bad practice. I'll, I'll say don't do this. And, and this is generally accepted to a bad practice. We don't do it. You can, though. Python lets you do it. So we can have variables that exist here that are accessible inside of functions here. So the idea of the scope, if you declare a variable inside of the function, its scope is that function. It's accessible in that function. Right? Scope is limited to that function. So you can't use it after the, afterwards. So if I were to say, hey, let's make a, let's do this at the top again, because otherwise I have to run a bunch of things first. Um, sure, so up here. So if I were to have a function like uh, 
add 10. Why not? And we'll say, you know, 10 equals 10, uh, or value equals 10. Sure, why not? And then we're gonna say print value. I immediately get a red line that says unresolved reference value. Outside of this function, value doesn't exist because we defined it inside the function. It's scope, it is only accessible inside the function. So you could say, hey, value is zero up here, and then we can set value to 10. I'll just call add, add 10, and then we'll print the value out. Let's give this a run. Uh-oh, we got zero. Didn't we set value to 10? Value is zero. We called add 10, so we printed out value. We get zero. This is why we get these little warning, these little, uh, um, what is it? Uh, just, it's just a warning, this little line underneath value. It's saying shadows name value from outer scope. Local variable value is not used. So because inside of the function we have something called value, we've confused Python. Python's like, oh, you must want a local variable inside of add 10 called value. And this is why trying to de declare these things outside and then use them inside gets to be really messy. Yeah? What if we return Yeah, so we can return value. But to do that, now we'd have to say, when add 10, we'd have to say value equals add 10. We'd have to reassign the value here. Right. So because when we call add 10, just because you return it, doesn't mean you have to do anything with it. Or maybe we say another value, right? Could equal add 10. It's returning something. You have to assign it somewhere here to actually hang on to it, to save it. So return just says, hey, function, give it back when you're done. We could print value up here, right? And that would print the 10 because we set value to 10. We could assign it here if we wanted to return the value. We've got some options here. It starts to get a little weird. So we set that we set this variable called value to 10 and we're going to give it back to whoever asked for this function. So I can have another value, I can have more, more values, is add 10. I can have the original value equals add 10, right? When we call the function, we get back a value. You can assign it if you want, you could just call add 10 without assigning it. Right? Like when we do random values, sometimes we would just say, hey, print, add 10. We're not going to store it anywhere. We're just going to display what we get back. Like when we round things, maybe we just print rounded the number. Well, when you return, you're saying that add 10, that's value 10. But the value is still going to value 0. So this value here declared is not going to change until we go assign it a new value. This will change what is stored by this variable value declared here. This is at a different scope. So this value is declared at the global scope. This one is declared at this local scope, local to this function. So it gets kind of messy. So you can do these sorts of things. Now with variables that have different words, so like this is, I don't know, uh, value to add, how about that, equals 10. I can say, hey, let's go and take value and set it to the value to add here. I can access them. They're readable, but I can't change them. So you can use the values here, but you can't change them here, which gets to be really weird. So um, I guess we did our add tens. If you want to use that value and go and change it, you can use the global keyword and say, hey, go get this global variable that was declared outside now I can go set it here. So this was the example. If you set name to NA, get name sets it here. When you print the name, you still get NA because it was not changed at the global variable. You created a local variable that you set without changing it. If you want to interact with the global variable, you have to tell Python, hey, I want this global one. And that's why it's really messy. And that's why it's discouraged. This is bad practice. We don't like doing these things. And we'll get into other ways we can do these sorts of things later. So generally ugly, bad form to do this. And it gets really confusing. Uh, but Python lets you do it if you want. So you've got the option. So actually, we could either create the variable within the function, 
So you could pass it as a parameter to use it, but so if we were to pass a, let's, let's, that's a fun one here. So let's have a function for like uppercase name here, give it a name. And we'll say name equals name dot upper. I don't know what that's it. Two upper, upper, name dot upper. I think it's name dot upper, right? Name dot upper. So if you pass me a name and you call a name upper here, and now we print name. So let's say my name is equal to Eric, or we can even do first name, right? First name equals Eric. We can print first name. We can call uppercase name, given my first name, and we'll print first name again. If I give it a parameter here, I'm gonna pass it, it's gonna use it here. I haven't done that shadowing thing. I, I don't have a first name repeated anywhere here. Right? When we run this code here, we get lowercase Eric when we printed, we get uppercase Eric when we printed here, we get lowercase Eric when we printed here. Remember, strings are immutable. You can't change a string. So when I give you a variable for a string here and you go change it, you're not actually changing the variable as it exists in memory. So when you declare a variable first name as Eric, Python says, hey, operating system, give me a place in memory to store this. And the operating system says, sure, here, go store it over this place. When I pass it, I'm saying, oh, hey, here's your value. It's over here. When you say name equals name.upper, this variable name doesn't change. It makes a new variable in memory. It says, hey, name, now you point over this way. When the function's done, first name still points at that original location in memory. We haven't changed what first name is pointing at. We haven't changed its reference. So it gets to be really weird because strings are immutable. You can't reassign them. You can't change them here. We can change where it points. We can make a new string, but that's not going to change your original. Now, something like lists that are mutable, that's what we did in our lab, right? We said, hey, let's do an add to list here, given some list. We could say some list dot append 10. Lists are mutable. So when I give you a list, you can go and add to it. You can remove from it. You can't reassign it. You can't say some list equals a new list, right? So you can't, if we have reassign list given some list here, if I said some list equals list of 10, 20, 30, right? And we print some list here. If I have my list equals, I don't know, one, two, three, one, two, and three, I can print my list. I can call the add to list given my list. I can print my list. And I can call reassign list given my list, and I'll print my list. So adding to the list is going to work because it's mutable. You can change it. Yeah. Yeah. So we could say first name equals uppercase name because this is a reassign. We're saying hey. Don't point here anymore. Forget where you were looking before. Point to whatever I got back, wherever that's stored in memory. That would work because you're changing where it's referencing. You're changing where it's pointing in memory. Because now we haven't we haven't changed the original string. We said here's a new string in memory. Look at this one. Right? We haven't we haven't changed the string. We said now first name points somewhere else. So that could work. Right? That's different than just trying to call uppercase on that here. This will change where first name points to its bring in memory. Okay. So if we're adding to a list and reassigning a list, when you reassign a list, you're saying, hey, this list now points to a new location in memory. We have that same problem. This my list has not changed where it's pointing. It's still pointing to its original location here. There's a lot of nuance and it gets a little crazy. So the first list, one, two, three, Right, we printed one, two, three. We called add to list. It added the 10 and we printed it because we interacted with the list. We can interact with it. It is mutable. You can change it. When we try to reassign it inside the function, sure, it looks 10, 20, 30. Some list points to a new list in memory, 10, 20, 30 somewhere. When we come back here, we've not changed my list. My list still points at the original my list and it hasn't changed. So you can't reassign values but you can interact with them. So it gets to be a little messy uh, with dealing with scope and things and functions. Um, 
especially making sure you've defined things, declared things in the right order. So the way that things get um, looked up when you try and say, hey, I want a variable of a specific name, it will look in the local scope first. So it'll look in the function that it's currently in, look for a variable of that name. If it doesn't find one, then it'll look in the global scope. Is there anything at the global scope with this variable name? If it doesn't find it there, it will look in the built-in scope, which is all of the built-in functions in Python, int and string and list and range. We can do those sorts of things. So if we wanted to make our own function here and do something insane, you can do that. Because Python lets you do fun things here. So let's say if I wanted to define an int function here that takes a value, I'm just going to return 10, right? And I can say, hey, let's get, um, I wanted to get an input here. We'll say, um, so your number is equal to an int of an input of enter your number. And then we're going to print your number, right? What do you think we're going to get when we run this? Enter your number. What number should we enter? 100. We got 10 back. Because we created a function called int. Int is defined at the global scope. So when we when we tell Python, hey, go use this int function, it's gonna find it's not gonna find it local, it's gonna find it global because we de declared it in our file int here. It will never get to the built-in scope to run the actual int conversion function. You can do all sorts of, and that's, it's just a warning. Python's going to let you do it and say, hey, the shadows, you're hiding this other thing. This idea of a shadow, like you've, you, you now you can't get to that other one because you've shadowed it. You've hidden the other one, which is really bad, right? We could make a new function, rand int, if we wanted. Uh, I don't think that's actually going to work for us, right? Because we need, it's called random.randint. So this one will work if I give it two values here, you know, first, second. Uh, I can't return 10 every time because when we use random values, we say, you know, print random.randint. So saying random.randint is specifying go to the random module, call the random function. So it's a little safer when we're using stuff out of modules. Um, that's all. We can't, we can't do that shadowing bit here. But it gets really messy, the, the scope resolution stuff. So ideally, we don't use variables at different scope. We don't shadow variables at different scopes. Now, when we did the project, I had a bunch of variables with the same name. I didn't care because we only were ever using them with the local scope. That's perfectly fine. Um, you just gotta be careful when you're doing it. That gets to be fun. So scope resolutions, fun stuff. Um, arguments as functions here, right? We're passing by assignment. Uh, if the object is immutable, right, you can't change it. If it is mutable, you can change it. That's what we just looked at. Strings are immutable, lists are mutable. You can go and change them here. Uh, you got to be careful when you do them here. Those are good. All right, here's another other fun, other cool things you can do with, with functions that start giving us more options. I kind of like their example here. Uh, we, might, we might just steal it here. If you are tired of writing citations, I'm fond of this one here. So we'll define a citation generator, right? You need to give it the author's name. You need to give it the title of the book. You need to give it the publisher and you need to give it the year, right? These sorts of things. So you have to give it a bunch of information and we'll print, um, you get the, we'll do a formatted string here. You get the authors first and then you get the comma and then you get the title or is it title first? I can never remember. I always go look it up, title, author, comma, publisher, comma, the year, I don't remember, some format here, right, for our citation, right? whatever the, the MLA or APA citation is, right, we'll, we'll figure it out. But you would have to give it these things, right? Now, this gets to be a little messy if I want to use a citation, right? So if we were to say, I want the citation generator, and I have the author was, um, I don't even know who the author of our book is. We have an author in here? I think we do somewhere, right? Is there an about? I think there's an about the book, right? About this material. Here we go. Here we go. Bailey Miller is our author. Sure. Bailey, Bailey Miller is the author. There's probably multiple authors are crediting to. The title is 
one here. Uh, programming in Python 3. I can't even copy that. Programming in Python 3. And then the publisher is, who's the publisher on this? Oops, this one. Um, Zybook, I guess they must be the publisher. Copyright, Zy Zybooks Inc. Zybooks.com, Zan. Zanti Inc. Zanti Inc. Is that the, the publisher? Sure, they must be the publisher. Why not? We'll make them the publisher. And then the year published, we'll probably use the most recent one. It looks like they updated it this year in 2023. Sure. There's our citation. So we can print out our citation here. Now, PyCharm is being helpful and saying, hey, this is the author, this is the title, this is the publisher, this is the year. Because it's pulling the name of the arguments from the function. So PyCharm tries to be helpful here. When you use like random dot randint, and int, and you get one and two, you have A and B. These are terrible variable names. I don't know why they use A and B in the Python library. I hate it, but it's fine. Um, I, I didn't write it. I'm just going to complain about it. So you can see what these variables are, which is very helpful. Not all of your IDEs do this. And depending on what you're writing Python code in, you might not get that. So you can use keyword arguments. We can say, hey, I'm going to make a citation generator, and hey, the title is equal to programming in Python 3, Python 3, and then the author is equal to, or maybe the year is equal to 2023, and then maybe the publisher is equal to uh, Zianti, and then maybe the author is, yeah, you can rearrange the order, Bailey. Right? So unless you rearrange or, or, or just even in code see specifically, hey, this is title, this is your, rather than you have to rely on your IDE helping you see these things. So you, those, are, those are optional, so optional keyword arguments. I can specify, here's the argument for this one here. Here's the argument for this one here. You can specify like that. Uh, I'll just get rid of that one here. Now, the other fun thing, like if I wanted to print a date, so let's define a print uh, date function here. You can give it the year, you can give it the month, and you can give it the day, right? And we're going to print in the best format here, which is um, a formatted string of, there's a formatted string, year dash month dash day, because this is the proper format here, year dash month dash day. This is, this is the right way to print dates, right? Uh, we do it so backwards in America with month, day, and then year. Europe is usually day, month, year. Uh, the problem is when you like list all those together, they don't list in numer in like sequential order. If you have day first and you go and sort by like alphabetical, you'll get January 1st, you'll get uh, February 1st, you'll get March 1st, and then you'll get all the seconds and all the third, because like, it sorts by the first letter. That screws up. So doing year, month, day when you sort, you're actually sorting in calendar order. Because it works, right? Which is which is so much nicer. So this is the superior date, obviously. Um, printing the date, that's great. So, but what if I wanted to make this easy for my user? What if I wanted to have some defaults in here? So instead of having to specify 2023, we usually just write, here's the month and here's the day. It's like, we would just say October 4th. Sure, we can do that. So what you can do when you define functions, you can have defaults. You can say, hey, year is equal to 2023 and month is equal to 10, and day is equal to four. So now when I call this function, I can call print date here, uh, print date, and I can give it 2023, I can give it 10. Oops. Oh my goodness, I'm pressing the wrong buttons here. I can give it 10, and I can give it four if I want, right? Or I can print my date, and I'll give it, um, how about 2022, and four, and I'll just let the date be defaulted. I'll just take the default date for it. Now this doesn't make a lot of sense, but that's okay. Or I can call print date, print date, and I give it just the year, how about 2020, and then we'll default in. So all of these are valid because I have default parameters. I have default values for all my parameters. Now this is where the keyword arguments become very useful. So I could say, hey, I wanna print the date, and I'm gonna say, Hey, how about the day is equal to um, 05 and the month is equal to um, 04. I'll let the year default. So now this is April 5th, 
2023. So that you can have defaults. This gets to be really useful in certain cases, depending on what we're doing with our functions. We can have defaults here. So back to their like printing carrot printing art sort of thing here. We can have a print triangle function here that takes a uh, I don't know a size variable, and then maybe we have a character variable, and we're going to default that to a star. So if you want, oh, sorry, define here. If you want to print with a star, you just let it go. You don't have to tell me anything here. So we can say for row in range size here, but print si uh, row, actually we want what, one to size plus one. Oh, goodness, stop hitting page up. I will print row times the character, right? So one for row one, two for row two, three for row three, as big as size as we get here, times whatever the character is, we'll use that character for printing, yeah. Um, I think the B is default, right? I think A, you have to give it right? random, and, uh, dot rand, rand range. I think you have to give it, yeah, you have to give it a start. Stop is optional here. So you have to tell it what to start at for the range. So here, you don't have to tell it where it stops. Right, so if you, so I, I guess if you don't give it stop, it goes from that to that value, right? So ran range 10 is going to give us from start, um, yeah, this should give us from 0 to 9, right? Yeah, so it, it's not actually the start, but because of the way it's defined, where the next one is optional, if you only give it 1, it assumes that was actually the end. Uh, we had that random file open, we could look at it and see, but I think that's how it's doing it behind the scenes. Yeah, so it, it has default values in here for those. Uh, so like when we did uh, range, it said, hey, range 10, that's actually, now my ending value is defaulted here. I can say range I want from 1 to 10 here. I can give it a start and a stop, or I can give it range with 1, 10, and I want to count by twos. Right? These are all default arguments here. If you don't give it the step or the like, count by, it's one. If you do give it, great. That's, it knows what to do here with this one now. Um, you can show me. There it is. Yeah, that's the. Oh come on, this one. Give me that version. All right, it's not the the. Uh, that's fine. We can look it up later. But this idea that you have defaults. We've used these defaults before when we do random range, range things. So we can default a character. So I can call print triangle, triangle of size 10, or I can call print triangle of size 10, and I want to use, how about the ampersand character this time instead, or how about I want to print triangle, I want to do size five, and let's do, how about the uh, pound sign? Okay. So you can give people options or a default, which is kind of fun. So now we can see, here's my default stars, here's my ampersands, and here's my pound sign. Not hashtags, they're pound signs, right? It's a hashtag when you also include words with it. You can be very pedantic with people and argue with them and then feel like you're the smartest person in the room because everyone uses it wrong. That's okay. Um, I don't actually recommend that. Um, but that tends to make people think you're annoying. It probably is annoying, actually, let's be honest. So. Okay, so that is optional arguments and keyword, or, or default parameters and keywords. So when we have a list of arguments, Notice they go in order, right? You have to, the first thing you give it is the first one. The second thing you give it is the second one. That's what, so keywords lets you do that out of order. So end, right, when we call print, end is an optional argument. Its default is a new line, right? We've used these things before. We just didn't really have names for them. And now we can use them ourselves when we write our own functions. Um, Multiple function output. So I think we looked at this, right? You can usually only return one thing, but you can return multiple, and it really just turns it into a tuple because a tuple is one thing or a tuple is one thing. It's just a shortcut in Python. So you can unpack that. So if I were to have, um, I don't know, um, git, we'll define git grade details. I don't know, sure. I can say return Eric and A plus. Of course, I'm getting an A plus because I'm teaching the class. If I don't get an A plus, something's going wrong, right? 
So then I can say, hey, name and grade are equal to get grade details. This unpacks the tuple for me, so I don't need to say, hey, my result tuple is equal to get grade details. And then uh, my name is equal to the results tuple index of zero, and my grade is equal to the results tuple index of one. Both work, right? But one of these is a lot less typing, right? My name, well, my name, my grade. My grade, right? And then we can go print these things out. So we can print name and grade, and we can print my name, uh, my name, and my grade, right? Both of these will work. Right. One is just less typing. So if you like Python to do the work for you, you unpack it. If you want to do it yourself, that's okay too. Nothing wrong with that. Have your tuple, have your tuple, your tuple. I don't know which one I like better now. I think they've lost all meaning. I've said them too many times. So I found out the gas station I can stop at on the way to work now that um, 96 is open at Wixom Road has coffee that is listed as extra caffeinated. So I've had two of those now already. And I don't know how much extra caffeine is in it, but I really like it. Really like it. It's good stuff. Um, I didn't I didn't get up early enough to make my pot of coffee and add my pot of espresso to it. Usually I do that, but uh, I, I did not. I was up too late. So I just stopped at the gas station and got extra caffeinated coffee. It's very exciting stuff. It's a socially acceptable drug. Caffeine, right? It is. 100%, yeah. Uh, it's not like I'm trying to get Adderall off people and take people to Adderall. I don't recommend that. that that's technically illegal. Technically. I've never tried Brazilian coffee. That's the, like, it's like thick and chewy, right? Because they leave all the grounds in at the bottom or something. Yeah. Yeah, that's good stuff. It's super strong. Yeah. <laughs> yep. I like that. So when I make coffee, like, I fill the, the filter, like, all the way to the top as much as I can. Um, other people make coffee, they're like, oh, I'll just put a cup of grounds in. No, 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 no. Keep going. Keep going. Sure? No, no, black. Um, yeah, thankfully. So I'm diabetic, um, but that happened later in life, just uh, like 10 years ago now, almost, maybe nine years ago now. Um, oh, that's all right. That's, I'm alive. There's technology for it. So um, the, my first job, we worked in an office inside a library. That's, that's where I, it was at uh, Oakland Community College, I desktop support. And, and there was no water. There was no kitchen at all. So you couldn't get water there. And I was a broke college student, so my parents weren't buying me Mountain Dew, so I stopped drinking Mountain Dew all the time. I had to stock up my own fridge, and I wasn't going to pay that much money. But if I wanted someone to drink, I could drink coffee from the coffee pot. Or I could go out the door, down the, the hallway, because there's a library, and there's no water in the library either, out the hall and get some water. So I started drinking coffee. And everyone in the office drank it black, except for the boss. The boss put cream and sugar in his, and everyone else would make fun of him for it. I was like, well, I don't want to drink cream and sugar now, because they'll make fun of me. So I drank black coffee. And that's how I learned to drink black coffee at age 18. Um, so, as a long story, sorry. I, I always think it's funny, though. Um, okay. Functions. Uh, look at this. Uh, standard deviation. You can calculate the standard deviation. I probably stole this idea from Zybooks when we did it for our lab, right? Look at that. Score minus the mean squared. The temp, the uh, total variance, average total variance. To the square root, they just do to 0.5 power, which is fun instead of using the square root function. Sure, either way it works. And you can return both values here, get your stats. This is fun. If you could have read ahead, you could have just copy pasted it, right? Sure. Um, the last bit here, we're almost out of time. We've got to talk about the next project too, is this doc string to document functions. Doc strings are fantastic. I'm going to be snobby and say it's not code, so I don't want to, I don't want to spend any time on it. But they're super helpful. So when we do something like um, randint, we were, we were looking at that. Where did that go here? We had it up here. We said random uh, randint. And, and I just hovered over randint. I got this thing here. The reason this shows up is because there is a doc string in that random file. Right? When I hover over print reading, I see, okay, you need to give it a name, you need to be reading, but there's no text. There's nothing, there's no more information. So if you want to give it a doc string, you can give it a doc string. Where's our add? Uh... Wow, we wrote a bunch of code already. Print reading here. I can give it in 
Um, uh, oh my goodness, I don't even know how to do these because I never use them anymore. There we go. Triple quotes at the start of the function. In triple quotes, I can say um, uh, calls the greeting function passed, then prints. This is a documentation string, a doc string. So this code, this code comment and, um, will show up when you hover over print greeting somewhere else. So when I go down to print greeting and I hover over print greeting now, where did that even go? Print greeting, here it is, uh, print greeting. Now that comment that I put, that string that I put shows up in this hover text. So it's documentation. So it helps people use your function. So it's very nice and helpful and useful. Sure, it's not code. So people who build libraries of code for other people to use, this is phenomenal. I love them when they do it because it helps you understand what's happening without having to go to a website and look at the documentation. Right? It's, it's built in. It's part of the tools. When we have an IDE, they show us this help string, this document string. They're great. If we're just writing our own functions, I'm going to argue, and again, this is a little bit of bias here, that the name of the function should tell you what it's doing. You probably don't need a doc string. Right. Um, and like rand int, don't use a and b, use start and end. Now, the reason they probably don't use start and end like, is because they're, they, they could be optional. Like when you do range, if you call the first thing start, it's not really start when you give it a start and an end. Or if you don't give it an end, it's really the end. So I guess I can see why it's a little weird. So that's actually the stop. If I give it two things, I'm giving it stop and start. So. Sure. Um, so great. They're useful. Go look them up. Um, no worries. You just do a bunch of things here and you can be as, as uh, explicit as you want. Some people will require these when you write code in class. Some people will not. I am the some people who do not. I don't care if you can write documentation. I care if your code works. Sure. It's a, it's a nice feature. It helps show everyone else you know what it's doing because you can talk about it in English. That's lovely. I, I care if your code works. So, um, yeah, awesome. I think that's it for the functions chapter. We did pretty good. So, you ready to talk about the next project? I'm sure, you're all very excited. All right, so let me pull up. Uh, oh, I have Canvas open already. Here we go. Uh, I got to add a new classroom link for you, real quick here. We'll do project two. Uh, this one here. Level one, three, project two. Okay, so I'm going to give you a little caveat here. This is not a very interesting or unique assignment, but the way that we're going to approach it is going to have you use lots of specific functions because I'd like you to use them in very specific ways. So if you just Google this, this assignment, we're going to play Hangman. If you Google Hangman in Python, you will find a gazillion solutions. They're not going to be formatted the very specific way I would like you to format it because I want you to practice very specific functions. Okay, Can, so go look one up. I don't care, like the actual how do we solve hangman is not the interesting piece here. The interesting piece is how do we use functions and pass arguments around and use our arguments and do those things with arguments so that we're practicing with functions. Is that, that fair to say? Okay, I'm sorry I keep looking at you because you're looking at me. <laughs> So I'm not, I'm not like staring right at you. I'm sorry. Uh, uh, Python template. All right. So we'll do this here. I'll give you a link. And we'll make a new Python. Uh, no, uh, project two. It says hangman with functions. Okay. So please submit the URL to your repository. Ready? Add screenshots of it running and a self-assessment using the rubric. Do the README. Okay, all that sort of stuff here. So I've used this before. I apologize. Um, I think it's a good way to practice um, functions here. So I'm just going to copy paste from last time. Give me a second here. Uh, two, right? It goes to, yeah, here we go. Build a hangman game with functions. Okay. Nope. Uh, this one. 
We'll see how well that copy pastes. Hey, I think it did. Okay. Uh, I gotta go change that one real quick. Shoot. Go grab that. So I gave a little starter code here when I did this. So let me go grab this. Just do that. So I'm, I'm going to give you this start here because, again, the idea is the function piece here, not the rest of the game here. So uh, two in this window. Is that right? Did I? Nope, those are all actually filled out. Hang on, I did something wrong here. Main, that's what I did wrong here. I'm sorry, I need to go back to the first version where I didn't give you everything. There we go. That's much better. APY, view file, come on. Oh, this is better, okay. So here's a word list. It's a list with a bunch of words. So, you can just pick a random one of these out to use for hangman. They're all longer words. Um, I think four-letter words are actually really hard, or three-letter words are really hard, but that's fine. So for a gallows here, right, when you print the hanging man on the gallows, right, this is the full gallows, right? So use this ASCII art to, to modify here. So what we're going to do in the assignment here, uh, let me give, this is 2023, project two, and then... Put that, put it back in so it gets the right URL. That should be good here. So we're gonna write a function for get random word that returns a random word from the word list. Write a function display hidden word, given the hidden word and given the letters guessed. So the hidden word is the word that we're guessing. The letters guessed is all the letters we've guessed so far. So on one line, you print a blank if you haven't guessed the letter, or you print the letter if you have guessed it. So we're gonna go through, loop through the word, see if you guessed the letter or not. If you've guessed the letter, print the letter. If you haven't guessed the letter, print a blank. We're gonna write a function for get letter guessed, given the letters guessed. So this function doesn't let you guess again the same letter, right? Eventually we'll return the letter that you've guessed, right? Make sure you only enter one letter. So I can't enter three different letters, right? I'm only gonna allow you to enter one, right? You can check the length of a string that was entered, that sort of thing, um, and make sure you haven't guessed that letter. So no repeats. We're gonna function has the word been guessed? that is given the hidden word and the letters guessed. It'll return true if the word has been guessed. This seems a little silly. I'll show you why in a second here. We're gonna function print the gallows given the number of incorrect guesses. It prints the gallows with the right number of body parts, right? With no wrong guesses, it's empty. With one wrong guess, it's a head. With two wrong guesses, it's a head and a body. Head and a body, an arm. Head and a body, and two arms. Head and a body, two arms and a leg. Head and a body, and two arms and two legs, and you're dead. Okay, um, and we're gonna function has person been hanged given the number of incorrect guesses, returns a true or false. So. And it just keeps on looping. So the idea is it's sort of like, hey, here's my letters guessed, here's the hidden word, here's the number of incorrect guesses. And while I've not guessed the hidden word and I've not been hanged, let's display the hidden word, let's get a guess. If the guess is not in the hidden word, our number of incorrect guesses goes up by one and we print the gallows. This sort of thing is essentially the game here using all the functions. So just by seeing this, you kind of know what's happening, but we, we haven't solved the rest of it here. So I wanna use those relatively unique functions here um, and I did this for 15 points, right? So let's do 15 points here. And this will be due in two weeks. That is the 13th, 18th, sorry, at 12.30 p.m. And then I gotta go add the rubric. So let's go add a rubric. This is for project two. I'll use this for grading and I'll just copy paste here. So hit random words, two and a half points. Sure, why did I do this? That's really annoying. Stop, get random word. Copy pasting is really annoying, I'm sorry. 2.5 points here. Displays the hidden word. Um, why? I hate when it like adds stuff to your copy paste. That is awful. Get letter guest. Okay, now that one copied, right? That's weird. I don't know why. 2.5, here we uh, As the word been guessed. Maybe if I'm just more careful what I copy. 2.5, add a criteria. We're almost there, sorry. Print the gallows, two and a half. I think it seems to work if I go from bottom up instead of top down. I don't know why. 
So you get points for the functions, right? The rest of the program I already gave you here. We're just writing those functions here, okay? So get those functions to work specifically, and they should just work with this loop, right? So your letters guessed is just a list of letters, list of characters. Your hidden word is the random word. Guess is start at zero. As, and again, we're just saying as long as you've not been guessed and it's not been hanged. So we're using these functions here that return a true or false in our loop. That's why they look kind of funny here. They're very specific. If you have guessed the word, the loop should stop. If you have been hanged, the loop should stop. Right? All right. So get random word returns a random word for the list. Display hidden word. You have to give it what the hidden word is, and you have to give it a list of letters guessed. That you will either display the blank or the letter. So like, I'm going to display the hidden word, right? So I display the hidden word, and then I ask you to guess a letter. So get a letter guessed. Get a letter guess. Given the letters guessed, okay, here's the list of letters you've guessed. Don't let me guess one again, and make sure I only enter a single letter, and then return that letter that you guessed, right? So I can assign it to here's my guess. Then real quickly, because Python's great, I can say, hey, if the guess is not in the hidden word, right? Strings are collections. You can use the in operator or say not in, right? Then well, has, the, has the word been guessed? Given the hidden word and the letters guessed, I return true if you've guessed every letter. I return false if you haven't guessed every letter, right? Print the gallows, takes the number of incorrect guesses, will print the gallows, right? Here's the full gallows, right? You can take out the, bo the different body parts for each letter here. Um, and then has the person been hanged is true or false based on is the number of guesses the right value here, right? You get um, one guess, two guesses, three guesses, four guesses, five guesses. After six incorrect guesses, you're dead. Okay? So you're also supposed to print this guy, right? Yeah, that's the gallows. So print gallows, right? When you call print gallows, should take the number of incorrect guesses and print the, the gallows with the right number of body parts. Yep. All right. Awesome. So that's the, the idea. Again, I know you can find solutions online. That's not the interesting piece here. We're trying to do it specifically with these functions to practice. Here's how we use functions. Here's how you pass different arguments here. Here's how you use the different functions. Here's how you return different things here. Okay. So not just any hangman solution works. So I, and you can see in the rubric here, you get points for the functions working. You don't get points for hangman, the game working. Okay. So that, that's the idea with this one. All right. Thanks, folks. Sorry to run you just a minute over here.